show you how valuable a single life is to the Lord. Can you understand the way God glorifies the Son of Man? It's because he submitted himself under God's mighty hand. Hello, and welcome to the Shepherd's Voice. Today, we're going to be reading the Word of God. We're going to be reading from John chapter 2. So if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and follow along. Okay, so we have our text in front of us, and it's about the wedding at Cana. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. In verse 2, Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. And we're going to stop right there. First thing we want to do is that we want to examine this text further, right? And notice immediately in the first verse, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus is there. Now, Jesus also was invited to this wedding with his disciples, right? Now, in verse 3, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine, right? And one of the things that we can notice about that is that Jesus' mom turns to him to tell him about a need that arose at the wedding. She knows him. Like, she's got to know that Jesus is the Son of God by now, right? Um, she must have heard already the things that were being said about him through John the Baptist, especially because at his baptism, um, the, the Spirit descended upon him and remained on him and John the Baptist was bearing witness about him, be saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? So it's interesting how the mother of Jesus turns to Jesus for a need. And somehow she knows that Jesus is like, he's going to be able to solve the problem. And notice how Jesus responds. He says, my hour has not yet come, right? So we want to ask ourselves a question, right? And that question is, what does Mary know about Jesus before this wedding? Right? What does Mary know about Jesus before this wedding? So what we're going to do is we're going to go and look at some cross-references that detail the life of Jesus before this moment. So here we are in our text, and we're going to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 1. And here in Matthew, chapter 1, in verses 20 to 21 it goes but while he thought about these things now this is about joseph thinking about the fact that mary was pregnant with a child that he did not father right so he was considering uh divorcing her but instead of divorcing her while he was thinking about it uh here verse 20 it says but while he thought about these things behold an angel of the, of the lord appeared to him in a dream saying Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, right? And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. How beautiful is that, right? Just that verse in itself, we can highlight it. He will save his people from their sins. So that's something that Mary already knows about Jesus before the moment in the wedding, right? And if you notice in verse 23, we highlight that as well. Behold, the virgin shall conceive, shall be with child, and bear a son, 
and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So these are things that Mary is experiencing about Jesus, right? Bef way before the wedding. And surely she starts to become aware of the fact that Jesus is a very special child, right? She, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So, of course. Now, we're going to go over to the book of Luke to look at the, the parallel passage of this exact encounter. So, moving on to chapter uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 26, it goes, Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, right? And verse 27, to a, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. Of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Right? And But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. For he will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end, right? And of course, she asks in verse 34, Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Right? And if we go down to verse 45, it says, Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. And now from verse 46 and on, Mary responds. She responds to the, the promise that has been given to her. My soul magnifies the Lord, Mary says, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his ma maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on, the, uh, is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Right? And we're going to highlight that. Now, that's incredibly beautiful because we, we see that before the wedding, Mary already has experienced some very supernatural things about the life of Jesus. And she herself was called favored and blessed. She herself had an encounter with God. And that encounter has, has increased her faith, has increased her knowledge of God, and her relationship with God, knowing full well that because she was a virgin when the son was, was conceived in her and that the child would be called the child of the Most High God, it is precisely this reason that she turns to him at the wedding for the need that arises at the wedding. So let's go back to our text. So one thing we notice immediately from our text is Jesus says to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? 
my hour has not yet come right and one thing we can we can point out about this response that Jesus gives and Jesus said to her woman what does this have to do with me notice this word right here this phrase my hour has not yet come my hour has not yet come and so his response to his mother shows that he's not interested in doing these things for fame or popularity, right? Because if you think about it, this is a moment for Jesus to exalt himself. This is an opportunity for Jesus to demonstrate his power, to demonstrate his, his prestige as the son of God, right? But instead, his response is, my hour has not yet come. So, of course, what he's saying is that his time has not yet come for him to be exalted right? And there's a verse that I would like for us to read that explains the, the exaltation that Jesus was talking about. He said, my hour has not yet come. So what hour is he referring to? Let's go to the text and find out. So in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, starting at verse 6, Here's what the Bible says. And actually, we can start at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, right? But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and, gave, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's highlight that. This is the exaltation that Jesus is referring to. He says, my hour has not yet come to be glorified, to be exalted. And so therefore, that's why he asks his mom, what does this have to do with me? Right? What does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And Jesus is focused on He's focused on the work of God. He's, he's focused on exalting God, not by thinking himself equal to God as a thing for him to parade around and, and exalt himself, but instead his equality with God, he doesn't take it as, a, as something to be grasped, just like it says. He did, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a bondservant and came in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, right? And so we see that here. We see by his reluctance to perform the miracle that he feels that he, uh, his hour has not yet come, right? So let's move on to the text. And what we're going to read now. We're going to read from verses 6 through 10. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification. Oh, pardon me. Let's make that red. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now, 
right? That's there's so much to unpack here. There's so much that can be said about this miracle that Jesus just performed. He he turns water into wine. And so it, the wine is so good that it is very clearly stated everyone serves the good wine first. But when, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now, right? And so Jesus performs a very powerful miracle. And, and we want to examine this. We want to examine this miracle and, and understand exactly what's happening here. We can't gloss over something like this. This is a tremendous, powerful demonstration of, of the power of God through Jesus performing this miracle that we want to know more about it, right? And so there's a verse that I would like for us to examine because there's also a, a similar, perhaps many of you don't um, aren't aware that there are other miracles that are similar to this one in the Old Testament. Um, and so we're going to read those that account to see that similarity at work, right? So we're going to go over to 1 Kings, the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17, verses 13 through 16. And this is a prophet. His name is Elijah, Elijah the prophet in the Old Testament. If you want to know more about him, you can read in the in the book of 1 Kings. He shows up and, you know, he's a very powerful prophet of God. And we're going to notice, and what we want to ask ourselves as we're reading this, is how does Elijah perform the miracle? And, and what are the similarities between the miracle that Jesus performed at the at the um at the wedding and the miracle that Elijah performs here and Elijah said to her do not fear go and do as you have said but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me and afterward make some for yourself and your son verse 14 for thus says the Lord God of Israel the bin of flour shall not be used up nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. So if you notice that, Elijah says in verse 14, Let's highlight that one. Oh. In verse 14, For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. The widow was concerned. Uh, let me show you in the previous verse, in verse 12. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. She was in despair because she didn't have many resources. And she was in despair because she didn't know where she was going to be able to get more food to survive. And so notice that in verse 14, Elijah says, For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. And again, in verse 15, So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour, in verse 16, was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Right? So there you can see the similarity between the the miracle that Jesus performed at the wedding because they had run out of wine. And so they asked and so the mom, the mother of Jesus, she comes to him asking him to somehow make more wine. And we see here in in this in this miracle that Elijah performed that he is able to, by the word of God, um, the flour doesn't run dry, and neither does the oil. Let's go ahead and examine another miracle 
that was performed in the New Testament, Jesus performed it. And so, and to examine exactly what is at work here, what is happening here that is allowing for Jesus to make water into wine, for Elijah to be able to help this widow and her son to produce food for several days, for him to be able to eat of it. And we're going to look at another um, miracle that is performed. Oh, let's go back. And that miracle that is performed is in the book of John, chapter 6, beginning at verse 8. And this is the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. So beginning at verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five bar barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in that place, in the place, so the men sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up, and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who was to come into the world. So we notice immediately that there is another example in which Jesus here in the New Testament is performing a miracle of being able to multiply the five loaves and the two fish, and feed 5,000, right? So what is happening? What is at work here that is allowing for these things to occur? What is it that's happening, right? And so what we want to do is examine that. And so how Jesus was able to turn water into wine, how Elijah was able to bless the widow with oil and flour, and how Jesus was able to feed the 5,000, was by the word of the Lord. That There you have it. That is the key, is that these miracles are being performed by the word of the Lord, right? And so let's go back to Elijah's miracle really quickly. Chris King 17, verse 14. And right there he goes, for thus, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day of the Lord, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. As you see there, as you notice, it is, it is the word of the Lord that the, that the widow would not run out of flour or oil. It is the word of God. Thus says the Lord God. And the Lord has given Elijah this authority to be able to speak on his behalf and speak miraculous things into existence because the Lord has declared these things. So we see that it is the power at work through the word of the Lord, right? The word of the Lord. And one of the things to note between Jesus and Elijah, though, is that Jesus does not speak when these miracles are happening, but Elijah speaks. We see that Jesus speaks, but we'll, we'll, we'll examine that further. So here, we're back at our text, and we're going to look at the fact that Jesus says, in verse 7, Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And in verse 8, he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. Did you get that? Were you able to notice how Jesus, in verse 7 again, he said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim, but then he said to them, Now draw some out. 
did you at any mo- point in this text read where Jesus said um, somehow that the wine is is going to be brought about? Like thus says the Lord, um, there shall be wine, you know, or he didn't say any of that. He simply said, fill the jars with water. And then there was wine. Fill the jars with water. And then there was wine. It's different from the from the miracle that Elijah performed because Elijah says, does says the Lord God, right? So this is, is meant to emphasize the greatness that Jesus has over every other prophet, over every other um, man of God. And because Jesus is the son of God, right? So let's let's take a look at a passage in the book of John. In the book of John, verse 11, starting, well, book of John, chapter 11, starting at verse 42. Jesus, right, in verse 41, this is the story about Jesus raising up Lazarus. So he's going to raise him up from the dead because Lazarus has been dead for four days and he goes to heal him. He goes to to resurrect him, to to raise him from the dead, right? And so in verse 41, it goes, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. In verse 42, And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Right? So I did you catch that in verse 42? Or in, rather in verse 41 also, where Jesus says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And then in verse 42, And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. So the father always hears Jesus, even when he isn't speaking. That's why in the miracle of the wine, Jesus doesn't say, thus says the Lord, there will be wine in these water pots when they are filled to the brim with water. But the water became wine because God always hears Jesus. Similarly. With regard to the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus blesses the bread, and it just continues to be distributed without running out. Jesus didn't say, thus says the Lord, there will be bread until everyone here is filled, but the bread and the fish were multiplied. The Father always hears Jesus, and we see that here in verse 42. I, I know that you always hear me, and that's what makes Jesus so much greater than the other prophet. This is truly the Son of God. And and every miracle that is performed is performed by the Word of God. And how powerful, then, is the Word of God? What should we be paying attention to when we're studying the Word? How powerful it truly is, right? Let's turn to Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verse 19 through 22, to drive home this point about how powerful the Word of God is. In verse 19, And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves, and said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. Let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. And verse 20, And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And verse 22, And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. So that in itself, that 
passage tells us exactly the the internal dialogue that's happening between Jesus and the Father when these miracles are being performed. When the wine, when the water is being turned into wine, Jesus is praying to the Father that he would hear him because he always hears him, that he would perform that miracle, and he did. The same thing happened with Lazarus being raised from the dead and also the feeding of the 5,000. The feeding of the 5,000, the Lord Jesus, he breaks he breaks the bread, he blesses it, and then it just continues to, to multiply enough to feed 5,000 people because he's, he's believing. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. So what Jesus is demonstrating here by the withering of the fig tree is that when you place your faith in the word of God and you have an intimate relationship with God, and God's purpose is for you to glorify Him by manifesting the power of the Spirit, then you will perform miracles by the Word of God. It is very clear. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Right? And then even in the previous verse, Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. It will be done. So let us go now to the book of Hebrews, verse 11, chapter 11, to drive home this point. And in verse 6, it says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So there's a there's a component to to having the reward of God, to being rewarded by God, and that component is to diligently seek him. We can't seek God partially and expect him to reward us. If we're not coming to him by faith, knowing that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Because as it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. And so we know that Jesus is being pleasing to God. He's being pleasing to God, right? So let's go back to our text. I hope you guys are enjoying this so far. So now. Moving on to verse 11. This, the first of the signs, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him, right? These are the beginning of Jesus' miracles. And those who are with him, they start to believe in him. They see, okay, Jesus is who he says he is. He is the son of God. Look at this powerful miracle that just came about. You know, he multiplied, he he turned the water into wine. So this is the son of God, right? And in verse 12, after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples. And they stayed there for a few days. And they stayed there for a few days. So one of the things that we notice, especially in verse 12, is that after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. But if we turn to the book of John, chapter, uh, chapter 7 and verse 5, we see... For even his brothers did not believe in him. It's an incredible statement to be made because his brothers were present at the miracle that happened at the wedding of Cana. The wedding, uh, the, the Lord Jesus making the, the water into wine, that should have been enough evidence to his brothers. This is the Son of God. But as you can see, for even his brothers did not believe in him in verse 5, right? So that is, it shows you 
what is exact what exactly is it that they're choosing to deny the truth about him it's clear that he is a prophet it is clear that he is the son of god it is clear that he has just to perform a miracle that far exceeds any understanding that anybody would have about the physics of the of the world or anything like that he took water and he he turned it into wine so good in fact that the master of the of the wedding was like wow you've served the best wine for last you saved it for last right but then if you notice in verse 7 Jesus tells them the world cannot hate you but it hates me because i testify that its works are evil you know i testify that its works are evil and so perhaps that gives us insight as to why his brothers were choosing not to believe in him because jesus was making himself an outcast by pointing out the evil in the world by pointing out the fact that the world's deeds are evil and so jesus was hated by the world because of his his pointing out the truth about the condition of the world and perhaps that's insight as to why his brothers even though they saw such a powerful miracle being performed chose not to believe in him as it says in verse 5 let's go back to our text So Jesus cleanses the temple. Right? In verse 13, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Verse 14, in the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables and he told those who sold he told those who sold the pigeons take these take these things away do not make my father's house a house of trade his disciples remembered that it was written zeal for your house will consume me right and so this is one of those topics that are very important this what's happening here what's occurring here is very crucial you see, because it says in the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Right. So the temple of God has become a place where business is conducted. And it has polluted the worship of God. So Jesus is rebuking the merchandisers because he is cleansing the temple of its traditions and calling people back to regard the name of God as holy. That's exactly what's happening here. So he told those who sold the pigeon, take these things away. Just take these things away. Stop. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me that just goes to show you the passion that jesus has for god the the love and the and the grace and the and the loving kindness that jesus is is the son of god and that intimate relationship is so powerful that jesus does not care if he is regarded as a lunatic or if he's exiled or considered an outcast he decides to stand by god and he goes into the temple and he drives out the money changers and all the kind of merchandisers that are there. He drives them all out because he says, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Now let's see how the Jews respond to this in the following verses. We're going to be reading from 18 to 22. So the Jews said to him, So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken forty six years to build this temple, 
and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Okay? There's a lot to unpack here. But notice how immediately the Jews come to him and they say, what sign do you show us for doing these things? What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. Now, if you're reading between the lines, this right here, what sign do you show us? Is the Jews questioning Jesus' authority? Who are you to do these things? Why are you doing these things? What is your problem? You know, what sign do you show us for these things, for doing these things? But Jesus understands the subtlety of their asking. He understands the subtlety of, of their question. So he goes, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. It's a defiant statement being made by the Lord. But it's a statement that is true and a statement that shows and demonstrates, first of all, the power of the word of God, because it's exactly what happened, right? We see in verse 22, when therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus has spoken. The power of God, the word, the power of the word of God. But another thing that we notice is the fact that Jesus says, I have the authority. I have the authority. You can destroy this temple, but in three days I will raise it up. But in three days I will raise it up. So Jesus is not intimidated by their, by their inquisition. In fact, he tells them, I am the Son of God. I am sovereign. I am here to do the will of my Father in heaven. And I am here that to oppose the traditions of men. I'm here to oppose the wayward ways of, you know, you guys doing all of this stuff in, in the temple of God that you shouldn't be doing. I'm here to oppose that. And you can destroy this temple, but in three days, I will raise it up. Those are words of power. Those are words of sovereignty. Those are words of, of Jesus of Jesus demonstrating his power. So he's not intimidated by them. And he understood their hostility. And they had the desire to, the, to kill him for his actions against them. But he says to them, you know, you can destroy this temple, but in three days I will raise it up. And But of course, they did not understand what he was saying. So that's why they respond to him. It has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. They didn't understand. But his disciples understood. And that's what matters, is that his disciples remembered. His disciples. In the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, there were those who opposed him, who would never understand where Jesus was going, where he came from, and what he came to do, and the words that he spoke while he was here. There were those who would never understand. But similarly, there are those who are his disciples who did perhaps maybe not understand it in the moment, but who were enlightened when the time came, when the Holy Spirit was given to them, or when it was time for them to attain to a level of maturity in the spirit. Then they learned. Then they became aware. And that's why it says the disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed. Remember, we discussed that without faith it is impossible to please God. So therefore, the disciples could not be ready to go out and to serve God in the ways that God was calling them to serve until they could grow in their faith to the extent in which they would be pleasing to Him. Now, the Bible tells us that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, that you can, that you can move mountains. So God clearly is saying that with, with faith the size of a mustard seed, that pleases him sufficiently. And he is able to do infinitely, exceedingly, and abundantly more than we could ask or think. But of course, his disciples did not understand it at that time. But they understood it afterward. 
And that's the point of this passage. So in, in, the, in the book of John, chapter 12, let's go to that now. The book of John, chapter 12, starting at verse 34. The people answered him in, the people answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? And then Jesus said to them, in verse 35, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. Verse 36, While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. Right? And in verse 42 and 43, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So there, it's an indication, it shows you that part of the reason that the Jews opposed Jesus at the, at the temple, when he showed those signs, when he overturned the tables and said, you know, do not make my house, do not make my father's house a place of trade. Part of the reason is because those men, they have allowed those traditions to permeate in the temple of God. They have forsaken the holiness or the reverence of, of the word of God. They are no longer exalting the name of the Lord. Instead, they, are, they have compromised and allowed traditions to be entered into the place of of worship by doing commerce now they started doing trade and because they started to benefit from it they didn't see a problem with it but of course that as it says it here in verse 43 for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of god and that's something that we all need to be aware of that's something that we all need to actively fight against, to make sure that if we're truly followers of Christ, that we're seeking to please God and to seek the praise that comes from God rather than the praise that comes from men, right? And then let's go back to our text. So starting at verse 23, now when Jesus, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, Many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. So as, as we mentioned, there were those who would believe and those who would not believe. But in verse 24, it says, But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people, and needed, verse 25, no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. So that is a very interesting Thing about Jesus, right? Now, of course, we've already been able to point out all of the levels of hostility that Jesus has experienced, and it's all boiling down to the fact that men prefer the praise of men rather than the praise that comes from God, and they also don't don't want Jesus. They 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 hate Jesus because he points out that their deeds are evil. You know, the the Bible says it. It's very clear. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its deeds are evil, right? And so look at look at this again in verse 23. Now, he was in Jer when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. Jesus is here to glorify the Father and to show people that he is true and that he is the Son of God. There's a purpose to, to that, as we read in Philippians 2. His, his exaltation would come through his humiliation on the cross. And his humiliation on the cross had a purpose for him to be uh, to atone for the sins of the world, to be the savior of the world, right? So that's what Jesus is focused on. And so because of the sign, signs that he's doing, many comes to believe on his name. But in verse 24, but Jesus on his part, 
did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people, and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. What can we learn from this? The person of Jesus testifies that he is real, right? He is known as the Messiah and the Christ, the Son of God, the King of the Jews. But he did not care for people to exalt him in their way. He cared about God receiving his due worship. That's what he was focused on. He was, he cared about pointing back to God, making sure that God was exalted in his ministry, that his purpose was to serve God with his heart, mind, and soul. And he, that's what he was focused on, right? He, was, he, was, he cared about that deeply, that God would receive his due worship. And that's an attribute that's characterized throughout the whole ministry of Jesus. He wasn't interested in receiving praise from men, but rather that men would have faith in God. That's what he was interested in. Have faith in God. And Jesus knew what was in man, and they didn't need anyone to tell him about men. Therefore, he didn't commit himself to men, and he should be our example on how we should live our lives, focused on the worship of God, and that others focus on God rather than us. That should be what our passion is. Our passion as believers should be that others focus on God and, and not on us. And it also should be that we care that others worship God, right? That they focus on him and that they worship him in spirit and in truth. And so that is going to conclude our study for today. I hope that you guys enjoyed this. This is a very powerful study today. Okay, so that was a lot, but I pray that you guys were able to follow along until now. Um, by the grace of God, the Word of God encourages us, and it gives us a place to, to really feel that peace and that loving kindness that comes from God. And also, as we continue to read the Word, we come to grow and understand that by our faith growing in the Lord, that we can also start to live our lives like the men and women of the Bible. That the, that the Lord is calling people now to have faith, to have faith, especially in such a dark time, that things are going to be okay. And that the Lord is raising up a remnant of people who are going to believe and they're going to use the word of God. And the Lord is going to grant them the power not to perform miracles so that they focus on them, but that they perform miracles so that they can focus on God. And remember that God, he visits his people especially in the darkest of times. So I pray that if you enjoyed the study, that you would, in, that you would join me again as we're going to read uh, John chapter 3 the next time. I pray that you may share this with others who may be blessed by it. And God bless you. That's a rigged way of life. But for fear that you lose sight and go blind of why it happened at all. In the words of our very own, I am. And from now on you will see the Son of Man. Coming in the clouds of heaven in great power and glory.